Let's pick up where we left off in the previous video. We were about to uh, finish uh, calculating the energies for the wave function we just determined for the particle in a box. Um, the wave function we determined was uh, normalization constant uh, square root of 2 over a uh, times the sine of n pi x over a where a is the length of the box and n is an integer. Um, one or larger. Uh, and if we take the second derivative of that function with respect to x and multiply it by negative h bar squared over 2m, since the potential energy is zero inside the box, Schrodinger's equation says we get energy times the original wave function. So taking that second derivative returns the same original function that we had but times n pi a, I'm sorry, n pi over a squared. Um, so that means that the energy uh, for this particle is going to be h bar squared over 2m times pi squared over a squared, all of that times n squared. Uh, we can do a little bit of math with the pi's under h bar and the pi here and uh, simplify that down to um, h squared over 8ma squared, where a is the length of the box, m is the mass of the particle. And again, all of that multiplied by n squared. Um, that tells us that energy is quantized with a non-zero minimum energy that we call zero point energy. So the particle can't have zero energy in this case, and it can only have energies that correspond to some multiple of h squared over h over 8ma squared. As a approaches infinity, the lowest possible energy will get closer and closer and closer to zero, and the differences between the energy levels will also get closer to zero, which gives us the same results as we had with the unconfined particle. So this is just a special case of that particle where the particle is confined to a smaller area. Um, what we have here is uh, some neat uh, pictures and videos that I borrowed from Wikipedia. It shows an animation of the particle as it behaves in the classical form. So this is the behavior of the particle here if we had a classical particle. Um, and then the first three energy levels of the quantum mechanical prediction. Notice that the wave function is always such that it's going to zero at the ends of the box. We've got a half wavelength, we've got a full wavelength, we've got three halves of a wavelength we always have a whole number of uh, half wavelengths in the box. E and F represent what happens hypothetically if we try to calculate it in such a way that N is not an integer. We find the particle's wave function constantly overlapping and interfering with itself. So B, C, and D are the first three energy levels. E and F are not energy levels. The blue wave represents the real part of the wave function, which is the only part we solved for. The red wave represents the imaginary portion. Now there was no imaginary portion in the work that we did, but the imaginary portion would be the time dependent portion. We were only interested in the time independent Schrodinger in the mathematics that we worked out. Um, now what we have here is the uh, wave function itself um, that we just showed, um, this time stationary, but we showed it in motion on the previous slide, for n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. If we square that, we get the probability density. So notice the particle is much more likely to be found at n equals 1 uh, in the center than it is near the edges of the well, and that makes sense as it's traveling back and forth. What starts to not make sense to the classically uh, inclined mind is that the particle, if it's at en energy level n equals 2, can be found most likely here at a quarter of a past 0 and 3 quarters of a past 0. And it can be here and it can be here, but it can never be here. And so we have these nodes in the uh, square of the wave function, places that the, wave, that the particle cannot exist in between places where it can. Now think about what happens as the uh, probability uh, density moves up to very, very large n, we're going to have very, very narrow uh, 
waves, very, very narrow probability densities, so that they run together. And the positions where the particle can't be um, become invisible to us as this becomes just a blur of waves. Um, and again, and that means it's starting to approach the classical uh, version. But down here at low energy levels, we see something that doesn't make sense to our classically inclined minds. The particle can be here, it can be here, and it cannot be here. Um, so how is it getting from here to here? Well, we'll talk about what that all means as we progress further through the course. Uh, from the formula that was given for the energy levels on the uh, previous couple of slides, um, energy equals h squared over n, uh, h squared n squared over 8ma squared. We can see that the spacing between the energy levels gets larger as n gets larger, and this appears to indicate that the energy spectrum doesn't become continuous at large n, um, and that has to be true. Um, that has to uh, become continuous. Um, in order for the quantum mechanical result to start to be identical to the classical result uh, in the energy limit. So a better way to look at the line spacing between the energy levels isn't to look at the difference between one energy level and the next, but to look at the difference um, in the proportion of the energy between one energy and level and the next. In other words, look at their difference as compared to the energy we're dealing with. Um, delta E over E. That is going to become very small as uh, N approaches infinity um, and instead of showing that here um, I'm going to, uh, we'll do that together as an example in class. So give that one a shot uh, on your own if you have time between now and then. Now we can apply this same mathematics that we just used on a one-dimensional box to a three-dimensional box where the particle it has um, potential energy zero anywhere where x is between zero and a, uh, y is between zero and b, and z is between zero and c. Some three-dimensional box that may or may not be uh, cubic or, or oblong. Um, then we would, our Hamiltonian would have second derivatives in three dimensions and our particle's wave function would have coordinates in three dimensions. In any case where this happens, that wave function is going to be separable into three functions, each one only depending on one coordinate. And uh, we will be able to apply the Hamiltonian in such a way that um, we're taking second derivative with respect to each coordinate. That means that um, look, y, z is treated as a constant when we take second derivative with respect to x. x and z are treated as constants when we take derivative with respect to y and then the analogous for z. And the energy that we get then is multiplied by each of those uh, um, singular coordinate dependent wave functions. Uh, the way this works out mathematically, there's that previous equation we just looked at, is that if we want to solve for energy, uh, we can divide uh, both sides of this equation through by the full wave function, x times y times z. Um, since they have y, z here, if we divide through by the full wave function, we get 1 over the wave function in respect to x. And then the same thing here for y, same thing here for z, and so the energy is negative h bar squared over 2m times 1 over each wave function times the second derivative. Now we had said earlier um, that the wave functions are going to be sine uh, of n pi x over a and we'll have a, an analogous expression n, uh, a different n, pi y over b, n pi z over c for the y and z versions if we take second derivative and the uh, of a sine function, then we get uh, the original function times the square of the coefficient that's inside the function, and then we just showed that we're going to divide out the original function. So all that's left behind is the square of what was in that function. That causes the uh, two pi part 
to drop out of the h bar. So again, we're left with h squared over 8m times n squared over length squared plus n squared over length squared in the y direction plus n squared over um, length squared in the z direction. And so we have a perfectly analogous result for a two or three or four dimensional box. Uh, the way that works out, uh, if we were to just plot a two-dimensional particle, we can only really visualize a two-dimensional particle in three-dimensional space because the third dimension then is going to be the magnitude of the wave function itself. But if n equals four, then we have four halves of a wavelength along the y direction and four halves of a wavelength along the x direction. So this would be a plot of the wave function itself uh, for n sub x and n sub y equal to 4. Now the consequences of this are uh, pretty interesting. If the total energy can be written as a sum of independent terms corresponding to different degrees of freedom, then the wave function is always going to be a product of individual terms, each corresponding to one of those degrees of freedom, one of those x coordinates. So that for the cube, if it is a cube, if a equals b equals c, the lengths are all three the same, then we have uh, levels of degeneracy. If n sub x is 1 and n sub y is 2 and n sub z is 1, we'll get the same energy that we did for 2, 1, 1 or for 1, 1, 2. Uh, so we've just uh, mathematically generated degenerate energy levels. Um, the number of states that have the same energy at each level then will be called that level's degeneracy. In the final video of this chapter that we'll, uh, I'm going to make in just a moment here, and you'll be able to watch in just a moment, um, we're going to look at uh, the particle in a box as it illustrates several of the postulates from our previous discussions.